Welcome to AI for a Better World. Today, we're talking about one of the biggest challenges of our time, fighting health misinformation. And to help us explore how tech can make a difference, we've got a very special guest, Andy Patterson. Andy leads the Digital Channels team at the World Health Organization and has been on the front lines of using AI and tech to get accurate health information to millions of people around the world. We're pleased to welcome Andy to the show. Andy, welcome. Thank you so much and thank you for the invitation of being here. Delighted to be here. Great. Andy, let's dive right into our questions for you today. Who has partnered with tech giants like Google and Meta to fight misinformation? How do these partnerships help get health information to people globally in ways that fit their cultures? It would be wonderful if you could share a specific example of how this collaboration has had a real impact on the ground. And I think before I answer that, I have to give you a little bit of history of how the relationships had started. So we actually started talking to tech companies before the, the pandemic hit. And we were talking about misinformation, about especially about measles, mumps, rubella and vaccinations. So we, were, we already had a few contacts in place. But when the pandemic hit, it was clear from WHO's point of view that uh, COVID-19 was going to be a big challenge for, for the whole planet. So I thought, I wonder if I could convene a meeting between everybody rather than just having bilaterals. And I was very lucky that the, the team at Meta were, were, were forward thinking and said, listen, we could host something and we'll help you with the invitations, um, but it's your meeting, it's just on our premises. And on the flight back, I flew back actually that, that same night. I remember typing furiously on my laptop all these ideas I had about convening and taking it to the next level of partnerships and building bilaterals and by the time I'd landed I'd formulated a plan but also the tech industry themselves had also formulated plans on how best they could work out and support us. The range of, of projects was from the policy side you know to make their misinformation and disinformation policies a little bit stronger we were advising them on how best to do that. We were working with product managers and product owners to see how we could get our content into people's digital journeys and we were talking also to social media companies companies about how we could amplify a lot of our content through their channels. Let's talk a little bit about some of the cool technologies you're using at the World Health Organization. Who, who uses AI, chatbots and digital humans uh, along with humans to deliver health messages? How have these technologies helped? in connecting with diverse audiences. Again, if you could share a specific example for our audience, it'd be wonderful. It's very important that we understand the power of digital, not only just the reach, but also the technology, what it can do. The job of my team is to get our content into people's digital journeys. If people are on your average mobile phone, you may have 30 apps, that, uh, maybe 35 apps. On a daily basis, you, you use, depending where you are in the world, between five and eight. Whatever those five and eight are, that's where I want our health content to be. One of those, of course, is WhatsApp. If people are on WhatsApp, why not provide them with a channel that they can talk to and get credible health information from WHO. They don't have to figure out whether it's misinformation or not. We come with a credible brand we, during the pandemic especially. If we can build chatbots to allow people to ask questions and get the answers they want 24-7, we literally had a volume of people asking WHO questions. There is no way we could have answered those without technology, without AI. One of the things that you asked was you know, reaching, reaching some of these populations. And some of the most vulnerable populations are the, the people who are just about connected. And then there's the underconnected. What the tech industry tends to do, and what a lot of UN agencies and NGOs and, and ministries of health tend to do, is try to aim at the hyperconnected. A lot of the projects are, are geared at people like me and you. We have multiple screens, we have easy access to the internet, but we are swamped with content and, and good content in this, in this shape and form. What we need to do is actually serve the populations who are starved of, of, of credible content or people who have 
access problems with data, but also connectivity problems, especially the data cost side of things is very important. So a lot of the time we aim our projects on low bandwidth, easy access products that people are using every day. I know you work with a lot of local organizations and I want to talk just a little more on how that helps. You reach over 300 million people with, if, with health messages. How does your team work with local organizations to make sure the information is accessible to people from diverse backgrounds? I'd love to hear any stories or any lessons you've learned from that part of the process. When you think about technology, a lot of the people measure success in, in reach, impressions, engagements, number of users. But the actual proof of the pudding, as we say in Yorkshire, is actually behavior change. So it's very important for us not to just think about information, but to think about actionable information, something that the, the user can do to improve their health, the understanding and their actual health, either in protecting themselves or as improving their health. So one of the ways to do that is also connect to, uh, to local authorities and local services. So that connection between the information that WHO can give about staying safe, being safe, um, or getting better has to be linked in some shape or form to a service of some kind on the ground um, should, it, should it be required. So what my team does is rather than think global and cascading down, we try and identify the vulnerable population that we're trying to reach and then retrofit the technology onto it so that we reach them. I want to take you back for a moment to the COVID-19 pandemic because clearly the work you did here had tremendous impact across the world. If you were to do it again, or let's say you were preparing for another pandemic, what would you do differently? What would you do the same? One of the things I've noticed, public health tend to forget the last emergency and reinvent the wheel. So one of the things that I would love to do, but we lack resources to do it, is actually to do a digital preparedness plan and have the technology companies work with us to put that in place. So I think that's the first thing is let's not reinvent the wheel. Let's use what we've already done and put in place and amplify and make it bigger and better and improve, but let's not just start from scratch. And of course, in the real world, this happens very well. The, the health cluster work together with the ministries of health, with people like UNICEF, Médecins Sans Frontières to respond in the real world. But in the digital world, we tend to start again. And so that's one thing I would really like to do better. The second thing is be more ambitious. I think that we we came out with this idea of what we could achieve and what the technology companies and our fantastic partnerships brought was 10 times bigger than what we expected. So I would say let's capitalize on what we've learned and do it bigger and better and then put in place long-term sustainable models to allow this to happen. Because what happened with COVID is that we had this huge outpouring of support on technology. But then once COVID was quote unquote over in people's eyes, that went away. And what we need to do is think of almost a, a health online collective where people will come together in the good times and in the bad times, but will be there constantly so that we're not just stepping up in emergencies, that we're already ready in emergencies. And this we say, as I said, we see it in the real world already. We need to do that with digital. I want to finally ask you one more question. Uh, focus a little more on health content. How do you create content, global health content, that really resonates with people? Are there any stories or examples or lessons you've learned from a particular experience where, you know, everything is content driven, it must be accurate, but it must also connect with your audience. What have you learned about creating content that really, really connects and has impact with diverse audiences, obviously, which is what you're dealing with? Yeah, it's an excellent point. And you know, when 15 years ago, when I was managing web teams, we used to say the three most important things on a website is content, content, and content. Yet people and teams would spend hours looking at designs 
and color palettes and, and where stories would be and links would be. But actually, at the end of the day, some of the most successful sites in the world are just content driven sites. It's really important that it's not just accurate, but it's engaging. There's a few things there that I've learned is that, first of all, large organizations like my own and like other UN agencies and other NGOs and ministries of health and governments tend to want to control the messaging so tightly that actually it's very hard to communicate that message over to populations. And almost what we need to do is almost like an interview where the anchor summarizes a five minute spiel into three, three lines. So it has to become interesting, relevant, digestible. We have to become extremely cool in the way we deliver. And what I've been objective, not many large organizations can be that cool. So we, we flipped a few things on it head, tried things out. And one of the projects I'm extremely proud about is it's called FIDES. FIDES is a, a collection of healthcare professionals who are online, who are influencers. Some of them are massive, some of them are, are very small. And what we do is we give them the talking points. We give them the information and the data. And we say, if this content resonates with you or your audiences, please just make content. But what they do, and this is what's crucial about content, is they make it engaging and interesting. They can also use all the human traits that an organization cannot. They can use humor, frustration, even dance and song. Plus, we, we work with the technology companies to not only boost those people to make sure they're being seen by the relevant populations, but also to get the insights from those companies as to what works and what doesn't. So we get these incredible companies to give us masterclasses on how to become better at doing your social media. And that's something I think the combination of having this wide variety of creators creating content, these creators can make it very relevant to news that's happening just now in their country. It's not WHO generically telling people about something. It's a creator from Uganda talking about the latest health services and talking about the latest scandal that's been in the country or the latest news item, making it relevant to those populations, also in their language. I think that's a really cool way that we are able to engage and make our content more accessible and interesting. Andy, I could talk to you for hours. Just like the first time we met, so many amazing ideas and great perspectives on how we need to look at this important area. Sadly, that's all the time we've got today. Uh, I, a huge thanks to you. I've learned so much from you. I know our audience will learn a lot from you. I hope we can get you back soon. Thank you so much for taking the time. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the invitation. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure meeting you and the team. You're doing a wonderful job. So keep it up.